Art of the Kickstart, Episode 10. Welcome to the Art of the Kickstart.com, where entrepreneurs are constantly pushing the envelope to build businesses of greatness. Inventors are innovating, creating the products of the future, and backers stand strong for what they believe. These are some of the great thinkers, inventors, and leaders of our time. Here are their stories. Hey guys, today I'm really excited to have Michael Werner on the show today to share his experience with Cynic Systems, taking home brewing to the next level. Guys, prepare to get drunk on awesome. Thanks so much for coming today, Michael. Thanks for having me, Matt. So, Michael, I like to start these interviews out with a success quote, something to motivate entrepreneurs that drives you in your own life. My kind of mantra, what I like to go by, business or life or whatever, is uh, think about things differently and think about different things. There's a lot of variations on it out there, but I just, I like to live by that because, you know, you see something, you, you, people have different thoughts and ways of thinking about things, but try to think about them differently, but then also make sure you're spreading it out. Make sure you think about different things. People forget and they get people, they think of the same things every day. So I think that's amazing as well. People really need to get outside the box, just like it's the Taco Bell saying, the whole cliche, but I completely <laughs> agree. And before we were on the line, you said you had a bit of an interesting story in entrepreneurship. So before we even jump into the cynic story, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today, Michael? Yeah, sure. I majored in entrepreneurship. I went to school for it. I'm a I'm from the I went to the University of Wisconsin. And I always knew I wanted to get in that world. It was just, it's just tough. It's tough to, to break, to break that more, uh, to crack that shell. Or I don't know what your favorite saying is there. But um, first I took the first job out of college that gave me the most flexibility and autonomy. It was a sales position. I'm from Wisconsin originally. Synac is, is headquartered here in St. Louis. Um, I took the first job out of college. It got me as much flexibility and autonomy as I could get. And it was a sales job down in St. Louis. And I'm like, I don't know a soul in St. Louis. I don't know what's going on there, but let's do it. Because I, what, what I'm getting at is I, I wanted the most flexibility and autonomy because then I could work on startups in my spare time. So if I would work, you know, 10 hour days, you know, Monday through Wednesday and then have Thursday and Friday to work on any little project. And I've done around the gamut from, you know, food to consumer products like Synec to mobile apps to, I mean, you name it, websites and services and who knows what. And I just kind of did that for a while. I, I did that. I had the corporate job for about a year while trying to work on startups and whatnot. And it just wasn't cutting it. I wasn't feeling I was making progress anywhere. So just about last summer, uh, did this, yeah, the summer of 2013, I just up and quit. I mean, I realized you have to you kind of have to jump off the cliff and build the plane on the way down. Um, there's never, there's never going to be a good, uh, a, a big sign that says now's a good time to quit. So I did that and I kept working on a few smaller projects and some were gaining some traction, some not so much. And then finally teamed up with some buddies to uh, start a co-working space. I don't know if you're familiar. It's the way to go. Yeah, exactly. So you sound like you're familiar. And so we just got hold of, a, of an empty building and I'm really shortening this story, but Got, I got hold of an empty building and kind of turned it out from an old headquarters for an ad agency. You know, it's three stories, it's 30 offices, it's meeting rooms, a wood deck, it's huge. Anyway, we kind of outfitted it and now we're running a, a I would call successful co-working space. So that was exciting and it really, it, it allowed me to bring all my crazy side projects under one umbrella and have those kind of people within arm's reach. Um, you know, knock on the door across the hall of a graphic designer, knock on the door down the hall of, a, of an accountant, of a lawyer, of a startups need these resources. And then I just, I, I did that. I did some consulting on the side, just helping any small business grow if they needed it. I'd work for anyone doing anything that I felt it interesting for free. I mean, I would just be like, whatever you need, I'll do it. This is cool. I want to help. Um, and then slowly just, what'd you say? Just get the skills. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, I just kind of took that. I just kind of took like took that risk. I said, I, I, I got this much money from from uh, corporate America. I'll live off my savings. Uh, you know, sleep on the floor and eat some ramen and whatever it takes. And did that for a while. And then, yeah, finally, I, I mentioned it. Yeah, right around New Year's, I was like, I, obviously, this lifestyle is not sustainable. I need to start making some money. So I, I turned my consulting for free and for fun into, hey, would you would you pay me a little bit? Can I do 
a little bit more work for pay, and that worked out well for a little bit. I got a part-time job. Uh, I used to bar. I used to work at a bar in college, and then I started working at a bar a couple months ago. I'm in totally the same boat as you, just trying to do anything to not do the corporate role. It's just it's miserable. Exactly. That's absolutely it. And I uh, just kept stringing things together, making cash here and there. I mean, me and my girlfriend, we were doing like we did the Airbnb thing. <laughs> you like just make money off your selling your extra bedroom. Just anything to make some cash. Um, and like you said, avoid a job. And then finally, yeah, I, I've been working. It just the kind of stars aligned that I, I had known Steve, the founder of Sinek, for a while. And we've just been kind of bouncing ideas back and forth over the year or so that he's been working on Sinek. And the stars just kind of aligned in, you know, in January or so. He said, hey, Mike, you know, you know beer. You work at a brewery. That was my part-time job. You know, you know startups. You've had some success. You run a co-working space this, that, and the other thing. And he said, hey, would you join my team? Would you kind of be like second in command here, running running the ship while I'm off doing other things for Cinec? And I said, okay, let's let's do this. And that's kind of where we are today. We've been working on the background of Cinec, and I mentioned Craft Conscious since about January. And now we're just guns blazing. We've been working towards this Kickstarter since, like I said, it's about January, if not earlier. And then now launched it on June 24th and it's been uh you know little to no sleep since but one heck of a ride. Yeah, you guys have been skyrocketing. Where did the idea for Cynic come from? Where did the new home brewing idea build off of? It's funny, like everyone thinks we're some crazy craft beer enthusiasts or something like that. And we are. I mean, we love beer. We I love craft beer. I'm I'm there's a million guys out there like me who, you know, buy a six pack I've never seen before when I'm getting groceries and enjoy that. But Steve was never a big beer guy. He was a former stock market analyst. His job was to identify opportunities, obviously, for investment and try to identify bubbles or things that'll you know go wrong. Um, and he see this. He saw this huge growth, this huge, amazing growth in the craft beer industry. He's like, "What is what's going to happen here? What's going to cause problems? What could go wrong?" And while he went on his business trips for for uh, being an analyst, he would always go to as many local craft breweries as possible. And ask like, what is your biggest problem? What what can go wrong for you? What what is your biggest complaint? Whatever. And resoundingly, he heard it's packaging. I can't afford to bottle or can. I can't. Uh, I can either <laughs> I can either produce, distribute, or profit for my beer. And <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I can only do two of those three. So he knew that it wasn't so much a distribution problem. That was a symptom of the real problem. The source of it was packaging. You know, we there hasn't been any innovation in packaging since, you know, before the moon landing when they when they came up with aluminum cans, and so we kind of first the first idea was to attack that. How do you repackage beer? What's the most efficient way? And that kind of that was the kind of first idea, and then that turned into what do people what do they what do you what do these breweries do now? And that is they sell and they fill growlers. That's the way they get their beer in people's homes. That's the way people they retail their beer. And then we looked at growlers and we decided that those aren't good enough. That's been a technology that dates back to like the Middle Ages, if not uh, not earlier. You know, it's just a glass jug. It can't, doesn't maintain carbonation. It doesn't do anything but hold the beer once for you. So that's kind of those two those two things. Helping helping brewers of all walks, from the home brewer all the way up to the biggest craft brewer, or, or you know, non-distributing brewery or, or semi-distributing brewer helping those guys better package their beer to better connect and with their beer consumers. And on the other side, and in the same light, helping beer consumers get better beer and more of it, more varieties of it at a higher quality and lower cost. And obviously people are responding to it. <laughs> so Steve sees this issue in the beer industry. How does he get this idea in his head out into the world? How do you create a product like this? Sure. Um, I mean, like I said, you, you create a team, you bounce off. Like I said, we, we had been talking for a while, you know, over a year, bouncing ideas back about it. And I'm just one of many that he, I'm sure he did that with bouncing ideas. I mean, you know, you, you, there's nothing better than talking with a friend about uh, some crazy business idea you have. Right. And so he did that for a while. He talked to the right people, the right engineers, the right advisors, we are we are fortunate enough in St. Louis to be in a very much fledgling craft beer market. 
and have the big brother of, uh, I don't mean that in a negative way, the, the big brother of Anheuser Bush in town. So there's a lot of ex AB guys that are more than willing to help and talk about products like this and whatnot. So it's just like, it was a right, it's a right time for the industry. It's the right place. And it's, you know, then Steve was the right guy for, for him to be so curious and to take the initiative to try to build something like this. And like I said, it, it takes a team. He, he found the right guy to see. We found a tremendous and amazing engineer. His name's Jeff, who, who built the, the packaging. It's, it's, that's really what the magic is. The, the dispenser is amazing. It's, it's portable and it's light and it's, it refrigerates and, and dispenses the beer. But, uh, but the magic is the packaging. It's the first ever flexible packaging for carbonated beverages, you know, so it's, it's groundbreaking. He's got 35 patents to himself. So, <laughs> wow, that is unreal. Yeah. You got to assemble a, a kick-ass team and it sounds like you guys are doing that. You're, you're transforming this. It's like a watershed or a beer shed moment in the industry. <laughs> and you guys have raised over $350,000 in your Kickstarter campaign. That is quite impressive. What have you guys been doing? to promote the campaign, to get people's eyes on it? You know, really, we we started, as you might have seen or whatever, we started with really digging deep into a passionate niche market, and that being the home brewers. We, we knew, uh, you know, in any industry, any product, you want to find a niche market, something to create evangelists, create zealots for your product that can be early adopters, you know, early 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 adopters of your product and we found when we first started kind of talking about and marketing the Cinec, we got unbelievable response people loved it they wanted to be all a part of it they thought it was great they would solve all their problems tremendous so we just kept digging in on that and talking to homebrew associations and getting getting to know people personally and then we we kind of capped it all with unveiling the Cinec for the first time to the public at the national homebrewers conference about a about maybe a month ago um, and again, just a lot of positivity and support and whatnot. And we just, we thought we, we're off to the races, guys. I can't wait to start this Kickstarter. You know, we were, we were excited. We thought we'd, we thought we'd get like a hundred grand on the first 24 hours. Like it was just lights out. And what happened was we just didn't, they didn't show up. They, I mean, is the product still great for home brewers? Uh, do we get a lot of love and support? Absolutely, but they were not responding with pledges. They're a little more cost sensitive, a little more uh, skeptical, a little more traditional, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the Kickstarter is for a new, disruptive kind of technology. People who are a little more impulsive, you know, I don't even mean that in a bad way. Just people who are ready to pull the trigger on things a little sooner. And so, really, day three, I mean, we started talking about it right away because we were obviously not happy with the results. Day three, we're like, do we pivot? Do we need to pivot? You know, that you, the whole startup mentality of when you are bootstrapping and, and start and being a startup, you have to be lean and agile. You know, you have to be able to pivot on a, on a, on a dime. And we said, okay, we always thought phase one would be the passionate subculture, the passionate subgenre of, uh, for our industry would be homebrewers. And phase two would be the craft beer enthusiast, you know, be, replace the growler, quote unquote, be the ultimate, you know, the 21st century growler. And that would be phase two, but it just didn't happen with uh, home brewers. So we pivoted and I mean, within 72 hours, maybe we, we hit our goal. We just blew it out of the water. I, yeah, we, we hit our goal around the 4th of July, if not on. And it's just been up since I think we're up to almost 375 as of today. Um it's just been great. I, I, I think that answered your question. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. When do you know when it's time to pivot something? How do you test that? I don't think – I mean, I think that's the golden answer, right? We all want to know when to pivot, when, when, I'm, when what I'm doing isn't working. I don't know. And I think, we, I think you do have to do your due diligence. You have to do your research. You have to you know, have, your, have your plans ready. And like I said, we, I mean, since, since February, since January, we had our, our plan. You know, we had our – Phase one, home brewers, phase two, craft beer enthusiasts, phase three, breweries, all the way up and, and onward. But you just have to be ready to, I think that's where the word agile comes in. Because lean means, you know, don't overdo anything to get the you know minimal viable product, all that stuff. But I think agile means you have to be ready to switch and pivot. And 
that doesn't mean when something doesn't work, throw your hands up in the air and do something completely different. It means move on to your next thing. And uh, it was just evident for us. For us, it was evident. We expected homebrewers to come out. Didn't happen. So we said, okay, we got to roll on to the next thing. But I mean, to, to answer your question, I don't think you know unless you have those plans. It, it's, it's cliche to say have a plan B because it wasn't plan B. It was it was part of a bigger plan. But you have to know when that first step or when that when whenever whatever step you're on, whatever you're doing isn't working. You have to be honest with yourself and honest with your team and say it's time to it's time to move. And like I said, we were not crazy. Obviously, now when it's all said and done, we expected 100 grand the first day and we got maybe seven or 13 grand and we're like okay something went wrong here then we spent the next 48 hours talking about a pivot and we did it on day three and here we are now so why crowdfunding you've got this idea in your head of what you guys want to do with cynic how you want to build the business how did crowdfunding figure into that basically crowdfunding is kind of a a home run shot it's kind of swinging for the fences for, for a startup you can be successful in a crowdfunding campaign we, you know, we take on no debt, we lose no equity, we're basically creating pre-orders from day one, we're creating a community from day one, and it just goes, and that becomes, it has its own viral effect where a crowd, a tribe is supporting us, and then they're obviously going to evangelize, they're going to tell all their friends and family, and that, you know, creates that viral effect. So really, crowdfunding was always the way to go for us. Uh, we had plenty of offers of you know, venture capital and, and uh, banks taking on debt and whatnot, but it's just why not go the crowdfunding route and just uh, Kickstarter happened to be the most popular platform. So that's why that's why we did Kickstarter. And it's gone so well for you guys. Congratulations. I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. I want to jump into the launch rounds now. How's that sound, Michael? Oh, okay. Today's Art of the Kickstart podcast is brought to you guys by Audible.com. I love podcasts. I love books. I don't know about you, but I think it's one of the best ways you can possibly get business knowledge and insight into your head, help further your career, further your journey in life. If you guys go to artofthekickstart.com slash audible, you can get a one month free trial and download of any audiobook on audible.com. Over a hundred thousand titles. They've sure to got everything you're looking for. And really what better way is there to take your business to the next level. Whether you're reading Steve Jobs, Guy Kawasaki, there's so many great options. Look at what the greats have done and learn from them. Here we go. Welcome to the launch round, where we take our guests through a series of rapid fire questions geared towards unlocking the inner inventor and entrepreneur in all of us. Get ready to blast off and unlock your inner potential. Let's do this. So what does it mean to be a creator and an inventor? I don't know. To me, I guess it's just kind of putting your putting your mark on the world, making the world uh, not to be too cliche, but you know, everybody should try to be making the world a better place, a little better than how they found it. And to me, that's kind of the most outward way to do it. This can contribute to society, contribute to the world. Uh, it's 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 the most rewarding thing that there possibly could be to me. I mean, it's all about. I think uh, <laughs> crazy uh, comedian Bill Hicks said it that. The purpose of life is creating and sharing. That's the most rewarding. And I totally agree with it. There's no money is not a, a motivation. Money is a means. It's not an end. And I think creating and sharing and just trying to make the world a better place or at least for me, that's what it's all about. And being an inventor, being a, an innovator or a creator is the best way to do that. Yeah. If you can build a business about around being a good person, around something you love doing and helping others, there's nothing better. And I always think it's interesting, the journey of life, where it takes us. Let's go back to when you were a kid. What did you want to grow up to be? Oh, man. <sighs> that's a fantastic question. I don't, I don't remember. I, I, I think that's kind of what, maybe that's what a, like an entrepreneur goes through. I, I Nothing sparked, like nothing tickled my fancy, so to say. You know, I, I do remember always wanting to, not in a, not in a, in a childish way, but I always wanted to do my own thing. Nothing really, I was always questioning authority. I never, if something didn't make sense to me, I'd never abide by it. You know, it wasn't one of those things where it's just the rules, just you got to go with it. And so, and not that I'm some kind of rebel or anything. I mean, that's just, you know, I'm not whatever, but uh, I don't know. I I wasn't, I never really had a compelling, I want to be an astronaut. You know, I want to be a firefighter. That just never dawned on me. 
If you could meet one of your entrepreneurial heroes, who would it be and what would you ask them? Oh, that's another great question. It's funny. I actually met Mark Cuban. I was at South by Southwest. Oh, wow. I was at South by Southwest and he was down, he was there presenting and I happened to be in the hotel he was in and I was getting a water and this guy comes up and gets a water too. And I look over and it's one, you know, you always do a double take with like a celebrity and I was just like, Mark, <laughs> but it's not, it's not that great of a story because I, one, you're starstruck and two, I didn't want to pummel him with questions or like pitch my startups or my ideas. I was just, we just kind of shot the bull. You know, we just talked about where to get a good coffee and how tired we were and women and stuff like that. So I didn't get to ask, ask him like a profound question, but, uh, so I guess that's not the greatest answer. I'm trying to think, you know, like most people, like I do, I do, uh, admire Steve jobs and what he did. Obviously I can't ask him any questions now. I don't know. I don't know if I have a, you know, one big question. Cause I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of people who influenced me in small ways versus like one person that I idolized. And I, I think we touched on it earlier. I, I don't really subscribe to just like, this is what it means to be an entrepreneur. And this is what you got to follow. Like every, I mean, I was influenced by the Dalai Lama. I mean, I'd much be happy to talk to him and ask him a question. I was influenced by, you know, athletes and, and movie stars and stuff. It's just people, people help you form your identity and your, your way of thinking and whatnot. And that's what makes it so hard. I know this isn't a good pointed answer, but yeah, I can't think of one role model in one question. I'm sorry. No worries. It's, there's so many choices. It's so hard. Let's go, let's go for another tough one. What have been three influential books that really impacted you, influenced your life and your journey? Sure. Uh, more tangible, more practical. I would say I really like the lean startup. Eric is it Eric Reese or Eric Rice. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the pronunciation, but that was really good and very, um, very humble. You know, you get a lot, of, a lot of the, a lot of most entrepreneurs have an ego, and when they write a book, it's even more demonstrated. But uh, that was really good, and it's, it's a good, it's a cookbook for a startup. It's not a, it's not, it's not so narrative or him telling his story. So definitely the lean startup was a good read. I read the basics, the you know, the four hour work week, rich dad, poor dad. Um, those are good, but again, I, like I said before, I don't let those kind of things influence me too much. They're, but they're good to you know be eye openers and good to uh, think a different way, think a new way. Totally off the reservation. I it's oh, it's super hard to read because it's so big and long, but. Uh, well, uh, the, just I, I will I will always go back to if I'm like you know lost I'll always read the first chapter of Moby Dick, like it is crazy inspiring. Like, I totally recommend it. you can read it in like 20 minutes. But <laughs> the first chapter is all about like being compelled towards your goals and your vision and your dream. And I, I mean that's the most I can think of right now. Those are pretty good ones. And now, what would you say is the most influential or motivational Kickstarter campaign? you've ever taken part in what have you enjoyed funny thing is is this this was my first kickstarter experience altogether i'm not a big backer i'm not uh nothing really inspired we we took tons of notes i mean the months leading up to our launch we thoroughly analyzed the most successful ones like oculus and um pico brew did very well and obviously in our industry we analyzed the crap out of like 10, 15 of them, but no, I mean, none of them like inspired us or like made me want to do Kickstarter or anything like that. I mean, this is my first experience with it. I do love the one that's kind of running simultaneous to us. So some guy did like potato salad and it just <laughs> yeah. went viral and he like got on like Good Morning America. It's just like, if I raise 40 bucks, I have never attempted to make potato salad and I will. And it's now he's at like 100K or something like that. Something crazy. Yeah, I love it. That just shows you, that illustrates the, the power of crowdfunding. I mean, if people get behind something, they get behind something, you know. I like it. And now let's jump out of the launch round. We're going to jump back into Cynic. So if you could do something differently for your campaign, let's say you were relaunching, redoing, whatever. You had the chance to go over and fix something. What would you do differently? You know, I think what's most important is trying and whether you're successful or failing, being very lean and agile and being able to pivot and learn. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go back on what went wrong. 
because it taught us so much and our pivot led to our success. But I mean, our biggest, you know, snafu or, you know, what have you is uh, the months leading up to the Kickstarter, we had a ton of admiration or love and support and interest from the home brewer community. So that's kind of where we wanted to launch. We were like, okay, these people experience our, the problems we're trying to solve firsthand. They're the most passionate and enthusiastic. Doesn't doesn't invade. It's not as disruptive as invading the craft beer world. You know, we're not asking to change anyone's behavior commercially. These are just home brewers who use crazy devices and and whatever in their homes for no commercial purpose. They just love love to make beer and share it and drink it. Let's give them a device or something like that. And so we were going to launch with them. And we thought we could, we thought we could sell at least a thousand units to you know to a th- to the home brewers in America, if not worldwide. And we were confident in that, and that's kind of what led to the quarter million dollar goal on Kickstarter. And then, long story short, we launched, and they just weren't there. And, and you know, there's nothing against them. We don't have, we're not angry at home brewers or whatever. It just didn't work out. They were either um, maybe they weren't as familiar with Kickstarter. Uh, they're a little more cost sensitive uh they're very part of a traditional market and it's very fraternal where if the buddy i trust doesn't do it i won't do it or you do it first i won't and then the other guy won't you know so yeah that's a long-winded answer but i guess i would say we wouldn't have launched with home brewers but like i said there's no regrets there we we learned we learned and pivoted and it just blew up after that and you've been an awesome guest today and previously with the technical issues, Michael. <laughs> so I want to ask you, if you had one piece of advice for inventors, people that want to create something great in the world, what would you tell them? I, I hate, I, I, again, I always try to avoid anything trite or cliche, but it's, it's in a nutshell, you have to go all in in a, in a quick, long-winded way. It's, and I, since I've been so kind of philosophical and out there, I'll get a little more tangible and practical. I couldn't recommend more. You know, you have to be comfortable, whatever, with your situation. But quit your job. Don't ever think you can do your startup at nights and weekends. Maybe you can for a little bit, but if you want to convince yourself, let alone everybody around you, you gotta go all in. My exact story personally is I waited till I could live for about six to eight months on savings. I quit my job. I worked for free for six to eight months, turned that into, you know, in the startup world, working on anything I found interesting. I started turning those leads and those relationships and work into minimal paying, you know, just like I call myself a consultant or a business developer, whatever the heck you want to call it. And that led to other opportunities. And then finally that led to Cinec. So I mean, I, it's not a it's not a recipe for success, or uh, I'm not advocating to quit your job right now. But that would be my number one advice to anyone who really wants to work on their startup or or own business or whatever. You've been an awesome guest, Michael. I think you've shared a really cool story. You've got an awesome journey, and people can learn a ton from you. If they want to connect with you, check out Cynic, or to see what you guys are up to, where can they see you at? Sure. Um, our Kickstarter actually closes in a little under 48 hours, you know, two days. So definitely if you want to check out the Kickstarter, just go go to kickstarter.com and, and you know, search Cynic, S-Y-N-E-K. Otherwise, uh, once Kickstarter closes, you can check us out, hopefully order one from our website. Website's just www.synexsystem.com. Again, that's S y n e k system.com you know we're on twitter at cinex system facebook all the social media you can connect with us anytime and usually i'm the one who's actually responding otherwise personally on my my personal email is m first first initial last name m warner w e r n e r at cinex system.com so yeah thanks so much for coming on today michael you've been an awesome help a great guest, and I love talking to you. Hopefully people reach out to you, and have an amazing day, dude. All right, man, you take care. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Art of the Kickstart, where we believe makers, inventors, and entrepreneurs are changing the world and bringing humanity forward into the future. 
I'm your host, Matt Ward, and it's been a pleasure guiding you through this journey of creation and innovation. I hope you're inspired by this and check out artofthekickstart.com to get more information and tactics to help you launch your own business, product, and dreams. 